Uh, well, yeah, the month of animation is over, so uh, I don't have to watch any more pilot episodes to animated series based on movies that didn't need a series based on them. So uh, let's check the old internet. Whoa, look at that. I got a $20 patron on Patreon. That's amazing. Uh, Henry Koslick. Thanks very much, Henry. And at $20, you can request your own uh, review. So let's see what Henry wants me to review. Well, as the old saying goes, 20 bucks is 20 bucks. There were some movies, terrible movies. Movies so awful, no one would touch. Then came a Matthew, sad little Matthew. Matthew decided these movies to watch. For every good movie, there's at least ten bad. Matthew gonna drag himself through the crap to find the worst ones there are to be had. Today's episode, Atlantis 2, Milo's Return. <sighs> Hello, Internet. I'm Cold Matt, and today we're going a bit outside my wheelhouse with Atlantis 2, Milo's Return, as requested by Henry Koslick, one of my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. You can request your own review for just $20 a month. Or you could just give me one dollar a month and receive episodes a day early and participate in Patreon polls. Uh, either way, it's much appreciated, and, uh, you know, even if you don't want to support me, that's fine. We can still be friends. Except you, you fucking spam bots. Atlantis is a film from Disney's weird era. They hit a low point in the 80s, which led to the Disney Renaissance starting in 1989. But by the 2000s, they had completely burned out. There's like a 10-year stretch where their animation department made Lilo and Stitch and nothing else worth watching. Now, that's probably gonna make some of you guys angry, but be honest. Do you like Atlantis or Treasure Planet or whatever else because they're good? Or because nostalgia? Anyways, I don't know that I have that much to say about Atlantis. It's nice art design, but that's about it. But it hit right at the tail end of Disney's straight-to-video sequel phase, and after the success of several movie-based TV shows on the Disney Channel, like Timon and Pumbaa and Lilo and Stitch the series. So someone ordered a pilot for an Atlantis TV show that was never picked up, so they kinda tweaked it into Milo's Return, which is an odd title considering Michael J. Fox, who voiced Milo, is one of the few voice actors not to return. Instead, he's voiced by James Arnold Taylor, well known for playing Obi-Wan in The Clone Wars. The only other actor to be recast is Jim Varney, who actually died during the production of the first Atlantis. Thus, his character is in one scene in this movie. And they assigned a crack team of Disney underachievers to direct. All three directors on this were well known for their TV shows based on Disney films and straight-to-video sequels. So let's see if this movie was worth the return, or if this was better a lost at sea. So the film opens on two sailors speaking German. Ah, det er hyggelig å sette seil med lysene på, uten man måtte bekymre seg over ubåter. Ja, men sovner du ikke spenger de der? Okay, handy tip for filmmakers. Don't start your film with people speaking a foreign language. It makes me think either I set this to the wrong audio track, or I accidentally bought the German version. Not to worry, they get killed by the Kraken. It's kind of fucked. Then, just to prove this was supposed to be a show, it cuts to the opening. Afterwards, we meet Kidda, Queen of Atlantis, and her... Lava Whale? Who can walk? Uh, this is Abby. Abby was not in Atlantis 1. They added an annoying animal sidekick for the sequel slash TV show. Gotta love it. But it becomes noticeable here that this was made in Flash or something. I'm no animation expert, but it's clear this animation is much simpler than the movie. Not that that's a surprise, it's a straight-to-video sequel intended to be a TV series. The animation is still pretty decent, it's just clearly cheaper than the movie. Anyways, Milo is married to the Queen, which I'm pretty sure happened at the end of the first movie. 
So it's not even his return. He already lives in Atlantis. It's the return of everyone except Milo as all of his friends come back to Atlantis. I'm pretty sure one or more of these characters died in the last movie, but it's been like five years since I've seen it, so I could be wrong. Not that that's much of a problem. They're gonna explain the whole first movie again. You not only discovered a lost empire, you probably saved the world from Rourke's plans for the crystal. And now you're helping restore Atlantis to its former glory. Thank you for laying that out for us. Are they even bother reminding us what all the characters do? Already had my doctor, digger, demolition expert, mechanic, each the top of their field. So they're worried the Kraken is some experiment Kidder's father made with the Atlantean crystals. But as they prepare to launch submarines to search for the creature, it attacks, causing Milo and Kidna's submarine to be launched wrong. Okay, okay, we're coming! Jeez. Well, you better hurry, cuz we're about to hit an undersea mountain! I'll give this movie some credit. There's actually some stakes. They're not just fucking around. Ah, <sighs> at least it was not Atlantean. Uh, sure. Uh, how do you know that? Just seems like an out of nowhere line to let the audience know something there's absolutely no indication of otherwise. So they go ashore and find a village. Why would there be a village there at all? There's no fish, and they're under constant threat from a sea monster. Just move! And watch these guys walk cycle. They're taking, like, the smallest steps, and all their motion is in their shoulders. <laughs> to be fair, everyone in this town is acting a little bit off, but not for any particular reason. The Kraken can hypnotize people, but it's usually indicated with green glowing eyes. These people are just acting weird. This is the town magistrate, Volgo, who tries to talk them out of staying in the town. They say he made a deal with the devil. Well, that's a plot point I wasn't expecting from a Disney film, let alone a straight-to-video Disney sequel. Is this gonna have to go on my satanic movies playlist? Yeah, turns out this guy made a deal with the Kraken to save the town. The town is provided for. But no one can leave. Now I know what you're thinking. Matt, didn't you just say they should move? Yes, and I am going to stick by that statement because they could have just moved. If your options are sell your soul to Satan fish or move, just move. And I gotta say, the lower quality animation is making Audrey look a little blackface e. It's lipstick. She wears lipstick, but sometimes in this movie it looks like she has big black lips, and the huge front teeth don't help either. Anyways, they find the secret cave where the townspeople worship the Kraken, but Audrey gets hypnotized, so a fight happens. <laughs> Jesus, Milo's got some legs on him! Like, he didn't just kick that guy off, he kicked him across the fucking room! So Vinny, who I secretly want to believe is based on James Corbin's character from Duck, You Sucker, but realistically probably isn't, throws a stick of dynamite into the ceiling, blowing it up and crushing the Kraken. But some villagers are blocking the door- oh, it was a non-issue. I said this movie had stakes, but like, come on. Also, they keep calling this creature a Kraken. And not just the characters with goofy accents. The Kraken! The Kraken! The Kraken! I'm down to my last shot! As am I! He says, and then immediately has a full load of bombs. Eh, minor continuity errors. What are you gonna do? But Milo's old pod has a full load of bombs, and it's not even an animation error. And none of their bombs have been strong enough to kill the Kraken yet, but five bombs at once is enough, I guess. Um... Maybe I'm overthinking this, but what powers does the Kraken actually have? Like, it has hypnosis, but how is it keeping this town's economy alive? This thing is clearly supernaturally powerful in ways we don't understand. And you're just gonna bomb the shit out of it? Anyways, everyone in the town is super happy about the fact that their economy is now destroyed, as they have no fish or fish devils to save them. 
the end of episode one. So in episode two, they go out to the Old West because of sand coyotes. More like a sandstorm made up of killer coyotes who were made up of sand. Episode 1, a man sells his soul to fish Satan. Episode 2, the crazy old yokel says he was attacked by coyotes made of sand. Seems like a bit of de-escalation. Where did you find this? In a pot? What pot? In a crate? What crate? In my shack. What shack? So, uh, they go to find this crate this yokel had because he found an Atlantean medallion in it, but it's apparently been stolen by the local antique dealer, Doug Dimodome in his dark, edgy outfit. Seems he has an Atlantean artifact, but Milo points out that it's not quite right. Then they meet this Native American dude. Ah, Crystal Guardian, our great teacher and protector. He revealed many secrets to the Nashoni. The path of the stars, the time to plant, how to heal themselves. And like Crystal Guardian, we will also protect our sacred beliefs from outsiders. Desert Atlantis. There's, there's Atlantis in the desert. That's the plot of this episode. There are ancient powers that will make certain our secrets are kept. Jesus, God, again? More creepy glowing eyes? Gee, I wonder why this never made it to the Disney Channel. Well... Probably because Atlantis wasn't a particularly popular property, but, uh, this couldn't have helped. And the sand breaks the car, and they end up back at Dark Dimodomes. He denies stealing the pots from the yokel, claims he doesn't believe in the coyote ghost, but then after he's caught with the pot, he does a 180 and decides to return it to settle the restless spirits. That's not suspicious. Also, I just want to point out, the way that they know this is the mole guy can identify rocks by tasting them. He's been doing this the whole movie, and presumably in the first movie too. So remember, kids. Eat rocks to identify them. Yo, what's up with the poorly cropped Photoshop edge on this cliff face? I wrote this review based on the Blu-ray version, I really hope it shows up in DVD quality. Just tell me it's big enough to hide in, cause we got company! Continues staring and not moving quickly into the cave. What? So in the tunnel they discover... Desert Atlantis. That's not 100% accurate, but that's basically what it is. The Crystal Guardian of Atlantis also apparently influenced the cultures of nearly every Native American tribe across centuries? Is this giving anyone else a bit of an ancient aliens vibe? <laughs> Carnaby! Oh no, Dark Dimodome's inevitable betrayal. Oh, about the pot. It looks like I'm gonna be keeping it, along with everything else in here. Dude, this is a national historical site. Like, Maybe you'll make something for discovering it, but you cannot claim ownership over it. Also, his plan is to seal them in a smaller part of the cave with dynamite, but like, why not just kill them? I guess because it's a kid's show, but still. Anyways, Dobby eats the ropes. It's a really easily resolved issue. Dude, once again, Milo's got some legs. Props for continuity. But oh no, it blows up, trapping them under rocks. I'd be really concerned if I hadn't seen the mole guy dig through solid rock twice so far. Oh, and the sand coyotes are back for this fucked up shit. What is this? Retribution. And that's the end of episode 2. Episode 3 begins with a Norwegian spear being stolen from Professor Whitmore by... Uh... Motherfucking goddamn Odin. Ah, this is a Leif Erikson Day episode now. I don't care if it's June, this is now a Leif Erikson Day review. Skull, my friends! So, uh... The Norse gods exist in the Atlantis universe. And they also use Atlantis technology. And in case you're curious, yes, Odin had a spear. I can't find anything that says it had lightning powers, 
but it was extremely powerful, so we'll say maybe, but I think they're just mixing it up with Mjornir. Although, maybe it's not the real Odin? Whitmore had a rival named Eric Hellstrom, who was super into Norse mythology and even called himself the modern Odin, and then maybe went insane. He called Whitmore recently to warn him about Ragnarok. At Ragnarok, the final night of the world, Odin will use the spear to summon the forces of chaos and destruction. He's gonna use the spear to bring about Ragnarok. Uh... Pretty sure Odin's one of the good guys in the story of Ragnarok, not the one who's gonna bring about the destruction of Earth. We ought to be nearing Iceland, and that naming just for show. What? Well, yes it is! It's literally called Iceland because everyone was moving there and not Greenland. So they started calling Greenland, Greenland, and Iceland, Iceland, so people would think the ice was in Iceland when actually the ice is in Greenland. That's where the ice is. If you wanted to go to an icy place, go to Greenland. And they find Hellstrom's Minecraft fortress floating. And a frost giant attacks their plane. Look, I'm just saying if the guy can build floating castles, frost giants, and can get this wolf and two ravens to work along with him, maybe he's not that delusional about being Odin. He does think Milo is Loki and casts them out of his floating castle, except Kido, who he believes is a Valkyrie. I see the resemblance. But Mole Man digs them back into the castle. You know, they play him for laughs, but so far he's the most useful character. So Odin takes Katie to a volcano to start Ragnarok with a volcano monster. Oh no, they threw Lava Dog into lava. I hope he's okay. <laughs> Jesus, you gotta be quicker on the uptake than that. So they fought a water monster, a wind monster, and there's this fire monster, and... an ice monster? N not a rock monster? Like, you're already in the mountains. It would have been nice thematically. Ah, uh, but they trick the monsters into fighting and they drop the spear. And Kino is quick enough to grab it this time and destroys the monsters. And they never confirm if the guy is actually Odin or not. It's implied, no, but I choose to believe Norse mythology exists in this universe. There's this continuous plot thread where Margot Kidder is worried that Atlantean technology isn't safe and that it shouldn't be in the hands of the surface world. And it just seems really shoehorned in in all three of these segments. Like, it was just something they came up with to turn three unrelated episodes into a movie. In fact, the resolution of this plot thread contradicts the ending of the second episode. In the second episode, she promises she can keep the secret of Desert Atlantis because she too has a secret she can't reveal. But then at the end of the movie, she lifts Atlantis from the depths of the ocean to the surface world, effectively revealing her secret. And that's the end of the movie. Well, Henry... That was a weird choice that I would not have looked at otherwise. But I'm kind of glad I did. Much like Atlantis, I don't think it's really good or bad, but it's certainly not boring. I could totally see someone being into this, especially if they're a fan of the first film. It went places I did not expect the franchise to go. But that fact, along with the relative unpopularity of Atlantis, makes me not surprised that this never got picked up. It is quite bothersome that it's three disconnected stories, and it makes it really obvious this was supposed to be a TV show. It makes it feel less like a movie and more like disconnected D&D campaigns. That's what all three of these feel like, just wild D&D one-shots. I'm sure you can figure out from this review if this film will be for you or not. And if you want a hand in picking the next episode of Matt's Funtime Bad Movie Show, just go over to my Patreon and for one dollar you can participate in the Patreon poll going on right now. We got Ninja 3 The Domination, Kindergarten Ninja, Killing American Style, and 
tiptoes. But uh, if you're looking for more Atlantis-related content, uh, check out my review of Dingo Pictures Atlantis. And until next time, I'm Matt, and... Wait! What about Emperor's New Groove? Alright. I'll give you Emperor's New Groove. It is decent. Not good. Not Lilo and Stitch good. Not even really Moana good. But it's decent. How are people to use these things if they're locked behind glass? It's for protection. I know what the spear is for, but why is it in a glass case? Now, the glass case is for protection. Wouldn't the spear be better protection than a glass case? Yes, but no. It's there to protect from someone who might want to steal it. Why would someone want to steal a glass case? My local library had this on Blu-ray, so I could have had high-definition footage for free, but my external Blu-ray drive broke, like, a month ago, and the replacement is taking all of goddamn eternity to show up. So, eventually I decided, like, alright, this guy's paying me $20 a month, I can spend $5 to get a DVD to make this video come out faster. You're welcome, Henry.